<laughs> Welcome to you all. There are still a few seats available if you'd uh, prefer to come up and, and sit in these seats. Maybe you could raise your hand if there's an empty seat next to you. If anybody that's in the back that wants to be comfortable during the, the presentation tonight, come on down and get a seat. There are also papers that were in the back, I'm not sure if we run out of them yet, um, that have some of the quotes of St. Augustine that Father Tack will be using tonight. So you're all here for the, the talk on Augustinian spirituality, right? <laughs> I just want to make sure, yeah. yeah. This is not Bruce Springsteen tonight. Uh, is the mic, the mic is working, huh? Yeah, okay. It's not, okay. Let's see what we can do here. Uh, let's try this. Room set up. Screen controls. Yeah, I haven't found. There we go. Testing one, two. It's getting better. Check, check. I always wanted to do that. Thank you for coming uh, this evening. We, yeah. Something wrong with you. Villanova University is thrilled to have with us Father Ted Tack, uh, who comes to us from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, Kasha Hall. Any Oklahomans here tonight? All right. <laughs> we have a few who have lived in Oklahoma for, for a little bit. The Center for Liberal Education and the Augustine and Culture Seminars, the Office for Mission and Ministry, um, are thrilled to have you here um, to be with us tonight to, to share some of your experience, uh, your, your spirituality with us, and your understanding of Augustine and how Augustine can relate to young adults today. Um, we're finding more and more that when, when we read Augustine, we can see how many similarities there are in Augustine's life to our life. And Father Tack is going to just share with us um, some different quotes that you'll have in front of you and some of his own life experiences. Father Tack has done many things with the Augustinian order. He has served at Kasha Hall as the headmaster. He teaches, he currently teaches, he served for 12 years in a true role of service as the prior general of the Augustinian order for the entire world um, and had his headquarters in Rome, Italy, but really traveled the world in uh, keeping the, all of the members of the order of St. Augustine um, aware of our community, of our fraternity, of our friendship, of our common life. Father Tack is an author who, uh, we have two of his books uh, here tonight. If Augustine Were Alive, Augustine's Religious Ideal for Today, and also As One Struggling Christian to Another, uh, Augustine's Christian Ideal for Today. This is the book that is still in print. Father Tack tells me this is still in print. He's done know how many copies are left. This one has gone out of print, but if we have a, a groundswell for more printing, maybe Alba House will consider uh, bringing it back into print again. So Father Tech, we're thrilled to have you here, and uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Aaron. You're welcome. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you tonight um, to talk about Augustine's spirituality. And I would like to express my gratitude, first of all, to Father Joe Farrell for the invitation which he gave me last May to come and be with you and to be the initial speaker for the Society of St. Augustine here at Villanova University. Uh, at the same time, I wish to confess that I am not an expert in St. Augustine. I am what you would call an amateur in the root sense of the word, a lover of St. Augustine. 
And because I have this love of St. Augustine and his teachings, uh, I want to make it clear to you that uh, it is a pleasure for me, it has been a pleasure to write and always to speak about Augustine and what he means for us in our time. Because Augustine isn't one who has just lived centuries ago. He is one who is still very relevant to our society and he can teach us a lot. When we speak of a particular spirituality, as I shall be doing this evening, we are referring to a particular way of looking at the gospel. Now, we all look at the gospel with different eyes. Whether we are married, single, religious, scholars, those well, less well prepared, Catholic or Protestant, we see things from a different angle. And it is the same with the saints. Augustine, Benedict, Francis, Dominic, Ignatius, or any of the other founders of religious orders, they all see things from a different perspective. And no spirituality can say that it is the best or the only one to follow. Because all are fixed on bringing the entire gospel to life while emphasizing one or another particular aspect of the gospel. As I thought about how I might phrase this talk, it occurred to me that not many of you may have had much previous experience to have an overall view of St. Augustine's spirituality. That is the way he speaks of the Christian life. Augustine is generally well known as a great theologian, a great philosopher, but there are not many who are aware of his life as a Christian or as a bishop reflecting on the gospel. Over the last 20 years or so, I have frequently taught a course on Augustine's confessions to many adults in the Tulsa area. And at the same time, I have taught this course to the seniors at Casha Hall, where I actually teach still. And it is very interesting to understand how fascinated the adults are and the students and how they respond to Augustine's odyssey, his message, and his approach to the Christian life. He is very down to earth, as any of you will know who have read some of his works. And much of what he lived and experienced himself is still relevant for our times, as even my senior students have no difficulty in eventually understanding. It's quite true they initially come to class very skeptical, what can this guy who's been dead for 1,600 years teach me, who live in the 21st century? But often within two or three weeks, that whole idea begins to change as they see the way Augustine, the youth, lived his life uh, in his own times, and how that is very much a mirror of the way we live even today. So let's look at some of the essentials of our Christian life that were constantly being emphasized by St. Augustine. These are the things that formed his spirituality, his window on the gospel, as it were. And taken together, these ideas form a nucleus of a plan, a program of life that Augustine followed closely himself and that he taught his people to appreciate both by word and by example. Augustine was not a man who lived in an ivory tower. He was one who had his feet firmly planted on the earth, but he kept his eyes trained on the things that were more important in life. And he kept his mind especially trained on Jesus Christ and how to make the spirit and the body work together harmoniously on our journey toward the common goal to which we have all been called life with God both here and hereafter. Now Augustine understood the joys as well as the problems and the pitfalls of youth at a more mature age. Without ever having studied psychology and valuable psychological insights into ourselves and others regarding the constant struggle in our hearts between good and evil the hidden motivations that frequently prompt us to act, 
The pride, which often destroys the good that we seek to accomplish, our insatiable thirst for true happiness, for God that is, and our great difficulty in achieving this happiness, the power of passion to assert control over our lives if we don't assert ourselves in an opposite direction, and the destructive force of division, as well as the beauty of friendship and living in harmony with others who share common interests. After his conversion and ordination to the priesthood and the episcopacy, he developed high expectations for himself and for his Christian people. He would constantly challenge them to go one step further in living their faith. And yet at the same time, he was very realistic. Listen to the advice he gave to adults that he had just baptized at the Easter Vigil. Choose for yourselves, he says, those whom you will imitate. Choose God-fearing people, those who enter the house of God with reverence, those who attentively listen to the word of God. Keep it in mind, meditate on it, and carry it out. These are the ones you should choose to imitate. Begin to live well, and you will see how many others gather around you, and what a great fraternity you enjoy. But then he added this very realistic phrase. But suppose you can't find anyone to imitate. What are you going to do then? Well then, he says, be yourself such that others can imitate you. Augustine was able to pair his understanding of human nature with deep insights into the teachings of Jesus. And that is essentially why he can still be a guide for all Christians today. Because he teaches Jesus in a very human way. He did not want to control the lives of others. Rather, he wanted to awaken in them a deeper awareness of the presence of the Lord, their interior master, who was the only one who could rightly lead them and grace them. His great desire was to guide and awaken within them the truth that resonates with the ultimate truth, which of course is God. Listen to the way he puts this in a letter he wrote to a young girl, Florentina by name, whose mother had requested Augustine to be her spiritual mentor. Now Florentina, do not hope with too much certainty that you will find in me the answer to all that you may ask me. I am not offering myself as an accomplished teacher, but as one who should make progress with those whom he is called to enlighten. Take it for absolutely certain that even if you can learn from me something good, your true master will always be the interior master of the interior person. It is he who enables you to understand in the depth of your being the truth of what is being said to you. Isn't this the model, the kind of advice all of us would like to have from a spiritual director? Now you'll notice on the sheets of paper that have been passed out to you that I have divided Augustine's spirituality into three parts, as it were. First of all, we are on our way to God. And we shall reach him through the practice of the two commandments of love as together we journey toward him in his church. These are the headlines, the headers that you notice on that paper front and back. So there are three compact elements expressed here. First of all, we are on a journey, a pilgrimage, whose goal is none other than to achieve to the presence, to the possession of God. This God is to be reached through the practice of Christian love as we walk together in the church. God, love, and church are joined together in this Augustinian view and closely interrelated with the one Christ. Jesus Christ is the focus of Augustine's spirituality, his window on the gospel. Jesus God is the way by which we reach the Father God. 
He is the object of our love. He is the head of the church, which brings us together on our journey to God. <coughs> and so I will begin speaking, first of all, about that we are on our way to God. This is the first stage, as I see it, of Augustine's search for uh, spirituality. Now, Augustine is frequently depicted in Christian art with a heart in his hand. I think we have some statues here on the campus that show that. A heart that is afire with the flames of love. And what art cannot depict, however, is another quality of that heart. It's an interior quality that drives it. And that is its innate restlessness. Augustine was very restless. If there is one saying by which Augustine is probably best known and best recognized, even by those who only have a passing knowledge of him, it is the phrase which he wrote at the very beginning of his confessions. A phrase that is often rendered this way, you have made us for yourself, Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Now it's true that we are made for God. That is, we belong to God. We all know that. But the original Latin text that Augustine wrote is much more expressive than what we have here in English. What Augustine was really saying was, you have made us to journey toward you, God. And our human heart will never be at peace, at peace or at rest until it has completed its journey and found God and fully possessed him. <coughs> what Augustine is saying is that restlessness is inherent in our human nature. And that human nature of ours can never be satisfied, completely satisfied, that is, until we have found our whole truth and happiness, that truth and happiness which is God, and which can never be taken away from us. As he puts it in one of, his, one of the parts of his confessions, happiness is to rejoice in you and for you and because of you. This is true happiness, and there is no other. Now, Augustine himself experienced this restlessness both before and after his conversion. Though, while he was wandering far from God and the church, he did not recognize what would make him truly happy. But that same restlessness ingrained in us by our Creator is precisely what made Augustine keep searching, despite all the blind alleys into which he stumbled. It's also what drives people today who are honest with themselves and keep searching in our own times. This inborn search for God, which we all experience, is not reserved to those who, like Augustine, wandered from their faith. It is rather a lasting and long, lifelong effort of all people who honestly want to know and to understand as best they can. There can be no limits to our knowledge and understanding of God precisely because God is without limits. He is boundless. And even when we discover one or another aspect of God's being, there will always be more to search out and to enjoy. We can never be totally satisfied in this life, as we well know, nor can we ever hope to fully understand God even in a future life because God is limitless and we are very limited creatures. Listen to what Augustine says in his commentary on the Gospel of John. Let us seek him out in order to find him. And when we find him, let us continue searching for him. We must search for him because he is hidden from us. And when we have found him, we go on searching because he is without bounds. <coughs> He fills the one who seeks him insofar as that person's capacity permits. And he increases that capacity in the one who finds him so that this person might again seek to be filled. In these few lines, I don't think it's hard to see how Augustine has given us a very practical example of that dynamic forward movement of our spirit, which I've already talked about. <coughs> 
We have been made to journey towards God and our happiness depends on accepting that innate challenge to get going and to keep moving forward. We can never allow ourselves the luxury of thinking we have already arrived, we have already reached the goal. That would be a disaster for us and for those who might look to us for an example. As Augustine put it in one of his sermons, let your present state always leave you dissatisfied if you want to become what you are not yet. For whenever you find yourself satisfied, you stop making progress. If you say, that's enough, you are lost. You must always add something more. Keep moving forward. Keep making progress. Now, Augustine makes a very interesting point here. We shall never be able to properly know God or find him if, first of all, we have not come to know ourselves. Who we are. What our relationship with God really is. St. Augustine's plea was this, Lord, let me know myself, let me know you. Honest self-knowledge leads to God. Fortunately, honest knowledge of ourselves is a subject which all too many people today seem to want to avoid or have trouble accepting when confronted with it. In fact, not a few seem to run away from this self-knowledge as it really scares them. As I remind my students, they often seem to drown their thoughts in loud music, excuse me for saying this, but uh, I find it very true with them. They try to drown their thoughts in loud music, blurring in their ears, something which makes it doubly difficult for them to think and to come to a better understanding of themselves. And yet this self-knowledge is a key to understanding both our need for God and his place in our lives. And in this, we too are blessed, for Christ has made the way easier for us. As Augustine reminds us, Christ is quite literally the way along which we must walk if we are to reach God. He puts it this way. Christ as God is the native land toward which we, toward which we travel. Christ as man is the way by which we journey. Christ himself is both the way by which you go to God and the refuge towards which you make your way. To walk, walk along the way that is Christ, we must also know him lovingly as a true friend. And this means that, there will, that we will have to read and reflect on the scriptures, enthusiastically, hopefully, especially the gospel, because it is there that Christ speaks to us on every page. The Lord has left us an example here on earth, says Augustine. He has left us the gospel. In the gospel, he is with you. He did not lie when he said, Behold, I am with you all days till the end of the world. And moreover, the scriptures lead us to Christ within our hearts in simple faith, prayer, and contemplation. Christ is truly the interior master, the one who will teach us what the preacher's or the teacher's words really mean for us, the one who will enlighten us concerning the mysteries of our faith. Listen to what Augustine says here. Enter into your heart, and if you have faith, there you will find Christ. He himself will speak to you there. I raise my voice, but he teaches you better in silence. I speak through the words of a sermon. He speaks through the fear that he inspires in your thoughts. Because you have faith in your hearts, Christ dwells there. He will teach you what I desire to proclaim with my word. Now what was it that Jesus asked of all of us? It certainly wasn't to learn how to heal or to teach or to convert others. No, it was nothing so demanding but rather he challenged us to learn of him because he is gentle and humble of heart. And Augustine insists that all Christians need to learn humility, which is nothing other, as Augustine sees it, than being honest with ourselves, knowing our weaknesses, 
and recognizing how much we need God. As Augustine puts it, God's hands are tied, so to speak, when he tries to relate with the proud. God can only draw near to the humble. We know how true that is in other aspects of life. For example, no one can be helped or can even help themselves if they're unwilling to admit that they need help. We know how true that is of alcoholics, of those who are drug addicts. There are many other examples that we could turn to. The first step to rehabilitation is admission of our need. Jesus taught us the same thing concerning the spiritual life. We must admit that we need help to grow spiritually. It's simply not something you and I can do by ourselves. Listen to these words from a few of his sermons. Learn from Christ what others cannot teach you, for he is the model of humility. Anyone who draws near to him must first of all be fashioned in that same humility. Only then can that person be rewarded by being raised up to Christ. The prouder a person's heart, the further it moves away from God. And when the heart moves away from God, it sinks into the depths. On the contrary, a humble heart brings God down from heaven and draws him near to itself. Now I'd like to sum up these aspects of the first stage of Augustine's spirituality. First of all, God makes us restless so that we might constantly search for him. Our search does not begin way out there somewhere in space, but within us. We must know ourselves and who we are and what our expectations may be if we wish to find God. God invites us to commune with him, especially through interior prayer or centering prayer and interior prayer which is not the preserve of a favored few, but is intended for all. <clears throat> Fourthly, we will never reach the goal of this journey unless we have learned the important lesson of humility. We have to learn to let God into our lives. Let go and let God is not just a phrase valid for alcoholics, recovering alcoholics. <clears throat> Such humility in no way implies that we look down on ourselves or our talents. Quite the contrary, our real task is to praise and thank God for these gifts and to show our gratitude by putting them to good use. Now the second stage of Augustine's spirituality concerns the fact that we shall reach God by living the two commandments of love. Now, Augustine is a very practical person. So even though he speaks frequently of the image of God that is sculptured within us, he does not intend us to pass our time here on earth just contemplating this particular fact, this mystery. Rather, his whole thrust is toward making us realize that this image challenges us to become like the one who has made us in his own likeness. And we do this by imitating God's only son. And that means listening to this son and putting his word into practice. Now, as we know, listening is important, but by itself, it's not enough. We also have to act because we are not pure spirit or pure mind. We are very much flesh and blood. Our human nature demands a totally human response, which is not the same as a materialistic response. To be truly human, <coughs> is to know how to join together the spiritual and the material. The central focus of Jesus' message then is nothing more than the twofold commandment of love, which, as Augustine points out, dominates the scriptures. Love of God and love of neighbor. As Jesus puts it, he who obeys the commandments he has from me is the one who loves me. Anyone who loves me will be true to my word, and my Father will love him. We will come to him, and we will make our dwelling place with him. Now, Augustine taught that if we genuinely love God, well, we could do anything that we wanted. As he put it, and this is a scandal for some people, love God and do anything you want. 
Well, it, it sounds easy, and it is, but he's also quick to point out that our love for God would not be sincere or realistic if our actions or omissions caused harm to our neighbor. And moreover, these two commandments of love are inseparable, and yet, though the love of God is by far the greater, in practice, Augustine says that we must begin with the love of our neighbor. This love of neighbor becomes a living proof that our proclaimed love of God is authentic. In fact, when Augustine comments on St. John's first letter, he turns almost his entire attention to love of neighbor. This is what he says. We love God with the same love with which we love our neighbor. Love of God is the first to be commended to us because of its greatness, and then love of neighbor. But we begin with the second commandment in order to reach the first. Love of God is first in the order of command, love of neighbor in the order of execution. In loving your neighbor, you cleanse your eyes so that you can see God. This interrelationship between love of God and love of one's neighbor is given a very concrete application as Augustine reminds us of Christ's identification with his little ones and with the members of the church. <clears throat> Just recall to mind the scene of the Last Judgment, as well as the story of Paul's conversion, when the voice from heaven thundered in his ears, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When we do something that is good for others, showing that we love them, we do this also for Christ and show our love for him. When we do something for Christ, we love and serve the Son of God and consequently love the Father because love cannot be divided. Augustine puts it this way. When one Christian welcomes another, the members serve one another and the head rejoices regarding as given to himself what was given to his member. Christ personally has everything. It is in his members that he is needy. But perhaps the most striking element in Augustine's teaching on love occurs when he points out that Christ himself is the neighbor we love and serve in others, just as he is also the God we seek to love and serve. Do you want to love God, he asks his people? You have him in Christ. Do you want to love your neighbor? You have him in Christ. In Matthew's account of the Last Judgment, Christ says, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was in prison and you didn't visit me. What he is surely trying to get across to us is the fact that it is not some stranger who is suffering, but Christ. It is not just a poor person, it is Christ. It is not merely some lonely or abandoned person, it is Christ. There is no way we can separate these realities in everyday life. Whatever you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, that you do for me. Today we insist a lot on social justice, and rightly so. But we must remember that social justice is not something just belonging to our time. It was true in Augustine's times too. He was very much insistent in his own homilies and sermons on the need for social justice. Each of you expects to receive Christ seated in heaven, he says. Take care of him now as he lies exposed in the open. Tend to him in his hunger as he suffers from the cold. Tend to him in his need or as a pilgrim. This vivid image of Christ suffering uh, in strangers, the strangers who surround us, tugs at the human heart. It reminds me so much of Blessed Mother Teresa and her missionaries who have done so many things in large cities around the world where so many homeless Christs are lying out in the open abandoned by everybody else and in need of great help. And because we are speaking of social justice, it is well to note how much Augustine equ equates justice with love. He puts it this way, where love begins, justice also begins. Where progress is made in love, progress is made in justice. Great love is great justice. Perfect love is perfect justice. Normally we reason that love goes beyond mere justice and so it does. But true justice is guaranteed 
only when real love, the love of God, is present in the one who practices this justice. And how much are we aware of this Christian approach to social needs and social justice? How much do we give witness in this regard? By our example, by our words, by our attitude toward the more needy among us. <coughs> this is certainly a topic which we need to keep abreast of, especially given the many great papal social teachings of our times and the pressing needs of so many of God's little ones. But Christ is to be fed and clothed and visited in the person of his truly poor and suffering. But how is he to be attended in the person of so many others who may not suffer such extreme needs, but who nevertheless are hurting, pained, misunderstood, lonely, weighted down with many worries? I think all of us know this group very well. We can think of the sick and the dying, those who have lost a dear one, those who think differently from the majority, the separated or the divorced, the unemployed, the handicapped, the many marginal members of our society. Perhaps some of these people are members of our families, are very close to us. Perhaps they work with us or they work for us. Perhaps they serve the church or society in some special way. Augustine certainly has these and other needy members in mind when he repeatedly appeals to his people and to us in St. Paul's phrase, bear one another's burdens, this is how you will fulfill the law of Christ. In fact, Augustine himself tells his people that he also has burdens of this kind. The burdens of the Episcopal office were very, not very light for him, I assure you. So he says to them, take up my burden and bear it with me. This is what he urges his faithful. He relates this to religious who live in community. Bear one another in, with one another in love. For truly, what could that person put up with who cannot bear with his brother or sister? He refers to the need for attaining unity in the church, which the schismatic Donatists of his time had shattered, and which Christ died to achieve. The one who loves his brother and sister endures all things for the sake of unity, for fraternal love consists in the unity of charity. He gives us the only realistic motivation for carrying these burdens ourselves. When he notes this, nothing can better, stimu better stimulate us to be eager to serve and to fulfill the task of bearing the burdens of others than the thought of how much the Lord has borne for us. As we're well aware, one of the most difficult tasks of love is in Christ's message that we must also love those who are our enemies. This goes strongly against the grain, especially for people who have suffered greatly at the hands of others. But Augustine shows us once again how to approach this challenge with realism, spurred on by the only motivation possible, the example of Christ towards us. Listen to what he says in one of his sermons. God loved us when we were sinners, but do you think he loved us so that we would remain in our sin? Look on your enemy in the same way. You see all his hostility as coming from the man, but you also see that he was made by God, that he as a man is God's doing, that he hates you is his own doing. And what do you say in your heart? Lord, be merciful to him, Forgive him his sins, strike fear in him, and change him. You do not love in him what he is, but what you desire him to become. And therefore, when you love an enemy, you love a brother. Now, even though all that I have said so far represents only a bare outline of Augustine's teaching on love, it's not difficult to understand from, from it that the central focus he puts on love and its very practical nature. We can hardly lift up our hearts towards God or journey towards God unless we are willing to walk with Christ in the person of our neighbor, following the two chief commandments of love. 
Life cannot be lived in the plastic bubble as we know, or by sealing ourselves off from the great pain and injustice, which as everyday realities literally surround us and at times get to the very heart of our lives. Love makes real demands on all of us. It compels us to act in reaching out to the suffering Christ wherever he may be. The third stage and the final stage that I see it of Augustine's spirituality is that we journey together towards God in his church. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the movie Castaway. How Tom Hanks found a volleyball, painted a face on it, gave it a name, and talked to it. And this is just another example of how we are all very social beings. And this third element of Christian spirituality, which Augustine emphasizes, serves to clarify this. We journey towards God together in his church. Our journey toward God and our love for God are not just a matter of our own hearts. As we have just seen, they find practical expression in our love of neighbor. And in the same way, we are not called to operate by ourselves alone as we make our way towards God, but rather together in community. Now, there are different kinds of communities, as we know, to which people can belong, the family, the parish, school, religious community. Yet all of these are part of the larger community of the church. And the church for all Christians is the ultimate and supreme community. Moreover, the church is Christ. The whole Christ, as Augustine puts it. Body and head united. And working towards a common goal. Community and church, as Augustine sees things, are key elements in our search for God. And in our service to one another. There is one thing in Augustine's life that he found to be absolutely essential for achieving happiness, and that is friendship. Augustine experienced a great need for friendship. From his earliest days, friends and companions were essential to his happiness. And when he sinned, he was often with friends and never would have done what he did if it hadn't been for them. When he fell into the error of Manichaeism, he did not want to remain alone, but he did all he could to proselytize, to win over others to his Manichaean beliefs. The same thing happened once he had been converted to the Catholic faith. By example and encouragement, he sought to share with friends and others his newfound joy. And even before his conversion, he had sought to form a community with his friends. Following his return to the church and his baptism, he had no other desire than to gather together with friends who shared his ideals and to dedicate himself to prayer, study, and good works. And even after his ordination as priest and bishop, he wanted to live in community with other like-minded individuals because he saw that... <coughs> It was precisely in community, that is, together with others, that one could first and most easily find God and serve him. Once he had accepted the church as the true spouse of Christ, his fidelity and love for this earthly body, despite its warts, its failings, and its sinfulness, never wavered. But Augustine also had some very serious problems as bishop and it concerned that he was living in a divided church. This was one of his greatest crosses. The Church of Christ in North Africa was terribly divided among the Donatists and the Catholics. The Donatist schism had wreaked havoc on the body of Christ. And it's no wonder then that the principal part of his message to the faithful and to all who would listen was directed toward achieving that long lost unity. Unity in faith and unity in love. He was convinced that even one who performs miracles amounts to nothing 
if separated from the unity of the body of Christ. How can anyone who has left the church, he is no longer among the members of Christ. How can anyone be in Christ if he is not also in the body of Christ? According to Augustine, we cannot even enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives unless we love the church. And we will only love the church if we remain united with her in the unity of charity. The faithful, he says, acknowledge the body of Christ if they do not neglect to be the body of Christ. If they want to live by the Spirit of Christ, let them become the body of Christ. Only the body of Christ lives by the Spirit of Christ. And it's interesting to note how Augustine also makes love of the church take on a very human proportion as he tells his people that their love of the church should be like their love for their parents, only greater. Love your father then, he says, but not more than your God. Love your mother, but not more than the church, which has given you birth into eternal life. Finally, as you consider the love due your parents, realize how much you should love God and the church. In the same manner, Augustine does not hesitate to indicate to parents that they must replace him as the bishop within their homes by concerning themselves with the faith of those who live there under their guidance and direction. In Augustine's mind, the family becomes something like a mini church, a small cell or community which has need of direction and encouragement in the faith. But the responsibility of promoting the faith cannot be limited to the four walls of one's home. The gift that has been given to us must be shared with others. And isn't that also the meaning of being a committed Christian leader? Here's what he has to say about this. Beware remaining inactive, my brothers and sisters. Each of you knows what you have to do in your own homes with a friend, a tenant, a client, one who is older or one who is younger. You know how God gives the opportunity, how he opens the door with his word. Do not stop winning others for Christ, since you yourselves have been won over by Christ. This brings up a further consideration of community and church. The need to serve others, the need to be of real help to the church, which really takes us right back to what we've already considered concerning the practical living out of the two commandments of love. And the reason is clear, as Augustine says, we must put the needs of the church before the needs of this passing life. We cannot remain indifferent to the very special needs of Mother Church, who has given us a share in eternal life. Augustine does not wish to limit the people whom he can perhaps influence, so he says, preach Christ wherever you can, to whomever you can, and in whatever way you can. Faith is demanded of you, not eloquence. And that's nice to know for all of us as members of the body of Christ, which is the church. When St. Peter found himself on Mount Tabor in the presence of the glorified Christ at the Transfiguration, he really didn't know what to make of it all. But he was apparently so happy that he wanted to stay there for the rest of his life. And so Augustine kind of takes him to task on this when he says Peter was tired of the crowd, he had discovered the solitude of the mountain. There he had Christ. <coughs> Why should he go back to toil and sorrow, since in God he had truly love and therefore a good life? Go down, Peter. You wanted to rest on the mountain, but no, go down and preach the word. Stay with your task, whether you like it or not. Correct, appeal, reprove, teach at all times. Work and sweat putting up with your share of affliction. To live with Christ on the mountain, Peter, is held in reserve for you after death. Life itself came down to meet death, and would you refuse to work? Do not seek your own advantage. Have love and preach the truth. I think sometimes all of us find ourselves in similar situations we are tired, exhausted, we wonder if the good things that we're doing are really worthwhile. And then perhaps we get a reprieve. Someone encourages us, affirms us, points out what a good influence we are for others. How wonderful if we could continue with that feeling, but we know better we can't. 
It's not the reality of life. As St. Paul puts it, all our talents are for the good of the community, not just for ourselves. It is a concrete living out of that bearing one another's burdens which allows us to be loving members of the body of Christ. Now from this brief synthesis of Augustine's spirituality which I've tried to present to you this evening, it should be quite clear that Augustine has much to offer to Christians today that he is indeed a very practical spiritual guide for our journey through life. His clear emphasis on the essential elements of our faith, as expressed most of all in his sermons to his people, constitutes a challenge to all who declare themselves to be Christians. What he says to the faithful is basic to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And that is that all of us are on our way to God, and we shall reach God through living the living practice of the two commandments of love as we journey towards God together in his church. Thank you. <laughs>